When did you get into town? Um, I forget. Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Today. Today's Friday. For a, so Thanksgiving. Did is there a reason why you came for Thanksgiving week? Nope. I just finished fighting and I wanted to come to LA. Cool. Yeah. Well, it was so nice to meet you. I loved your energy as soon as I met you. I think everybody that meets you feels the same, right? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. You're yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. How did you get into martial arts? That was one of the, the things I was like, what? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so pole dancing led me to MMA. And I know it sounds like a crazy way to get there, but uh, I was so skilled as an aerialist, um, even though I was a stripper. I always looked at it like a skill and I loved it. So I was so good at that that somebody saw me, my manager at the time. Your manager at the time. Yeah. And he was like, you know, if you put that same skill that you put towards the pole, towards something like fighting, you might do something with your life. Huh. I was like, all right, dude, teach me how to fight. And um, he was like, no, absolutely not. He's like, people go to the gym to get away from people like you. I was like, bro, if you teach me how to fight, I promise, like, I'll behave. I'll be respectful. Because I was kind of crazy, you know. And uh, still am. You know, the energy. It's a lot. Uh -huh. And uh, he's like, all right. So he started teaching me. And um, three he, months he, after he that, he was, uh, he was my trainer. Yeah. My Muay Thai coach. Muay Thai coach. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after three months, I had my first Muay Thai fight. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So he just happened to be a, a Muay Thai trainer, a Muay Thai mm -hmm. coach. And uh, and then he got you doing that. And then how did you get into jiu-jitsu? Um, we started to build a MMA gym. And because uh, like I was doing Muay Thai for like two years mm. and someone asked us to help them to build their gym. And we had someone uh, from Brazil come over, uh, Vitor Oliveira uh, okay. from GF Team. Okay. And he was like, you know just learning English, like straight from Brazil and, uh, teaching us jujitsu, but I didn't want to learn. I just wanted to like do Muay Thai. Mm. And everyone's like, girl, like you got to start fighting MMA. Like that's where everything's going. And I'm like, nah, like Ooh. cool. But what year was this? Oh man. 2011. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 2011. More than a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, you got to start fighting MMA. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll just walk in there and head kick everybody. And they're like, no, no, like you have to learn jujitsu. So I kind of got like roped into it uh -huh. and I didn't want to learn jujitsu. And I'm not even going to lie. Like for the first six months, I cried almost every single day that I was on the mats. Hmm. Like it was not for me at all, <laughs> but, um, I stuck with it and I kept showing up every day, even though it was really difficult for me emotionally and and, and physically, I'm small, you know, I, at the time I was like 120 pounds, like soaking wet and, um, just getting owned by, by these people. So I, but I, I kept growing my skill and then I finally started competing in jujitsu and having a lot of success. And it was really cool. I won the world's, uh, the first year that I ever competed in wow. jujitsu. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And has it always been the same, the same gym? I stayed at Ronin Training Center for eight years. Okay. Six or eight years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like travel around the country, you know, just because Ronin, I Ronin Gym was the was the Muay Thai gym that you started to do MMA at mm -hmm. as well. Ronin like, Training Center was um, like the branch of the Muay Thai that like we came over there to create this MMA gym. Yeah. And then GF Team was my jujitsu school. Okay. And then how did you get uh, connected with uh, the Armbar Hunter? I Mr. Jiva Santana. Yes. Um, I came here to California to grow in MMA and to like expand my skills. And I met Jiva. Oh, so it was in, you weren't in Orange County. You were in. I was in, I started fighting out of um, Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, actually. Ohio. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. Sorry. I didn't mention that part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was in Columbus, Ohio for a long time. And then I moved here to California. Um, I forget what year it was, maybe 2018. Okay. Yes. Uh, and recently. Yes. And then I started uh, doing MMA jiu-jitsu under Jiva, but I kept my GF team flag for whenever I competed in the gi because I was still competing in jiu-jitsu even though I was now fighting MMA mm -hmm. for the LFA. With the gi you would compete? I would compete in the gi and in wow. no gi. Yeah. Wow. 
<laughs> so it was super cool. I loved it. And Jiva was just so amazing. He would come and like corner me for my MMA fights, but then he'd also come to my jujitsu tournaments too and just give me so much love, even though at the time I wasn't representing his banner, mm -hmm. you know, but Jiva was just so genuine and so amazing. And um, after a while, it's like, I live here in California. I don't live in Ohio anymore. And I had, you know, the talk with my professor, like, hey, like, I, I keep trying to come back there and get knowledge from you, but I am living here now. And um, we both agreed that it would be a better fit if I just moved under Jiva. Yeah. But, like, that's so hard, you know, like, because loyalty is so important because mm -hmm. we are all family. Yeah. So I got it's a my, lot of years. A year, a lot of eight, years. eight years, right? That was built your foundation. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. I got all the way to, I believe, two stripe brown belt under my original professor. What was his name? Uh, Vitor Oliveira. Vitor Oliveira. Okay. Yes. The same one. Okay. Yes. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. And I uh, must be so proud, you know, seeing you, seeing you fight now in the UFC yeah. from the beginning days. Of it, it's super cool to go back home. Yeah. I'm going to go back home for uh, Christmas is now coming up right now. And I'm going to go home for two weeks and make sure I spend some time and go back to the gym and see everybody. And yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> and how did you get involved with, um, with going to Arizona? Um, I went to Phoenix. Uh, I, I ended up meeting this coach, Santino DeFranco, and he is like a savant when it comes to MMA. Santino is amazing. You know, like he's a black belt in jujitsu. He's fought in K1. He made it to the UFC. Like he's he's done it all. And he's um, risen champions, you know, from nothing. Mm. And champions come actually to our gym to learn from Santino prior to going out into battle, you know, Santino and Eddie Cha, and it just like felt like a right fit. Um, some things kind of started going a little bit sideways here in California mm. and, uh, it was a really hard decision for me to make, but I gave him a call and I was like, Hey dude, can I come out? During the pandemic time, huh? Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I think pandemic got everybody. Yeah, I was yeah. like, get me out of LA. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> the, I was the, stuck, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was out of here, man. So yeah, so I found Santino out there. So things things were more open in Arizona, right? At the yeah. at the time. That's yeah. cool. And I was dancing still. So I was still a stripper. You're, no way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What a I, story. Yeah. And the clubs were open out there. So I'm like, man, like living here in LA, like everything so was shut like down. They, the girl, they could talk, talk about, I'm putting myself through college. You're like, I'm putting myself through, <laughs> through <laughs> to become a UFC fighter. I'm putting myself <laughs> to punch people in the face. Yes. <laughs> It was amazing. So I, I went out there. I could work. I could train um, all in the same city. Because even when I was living here in Los Angeles, I didn't work in Los Angeles. I worked in Las Vegas. So like I would train all week long, you know, uh, two to three times a day here. And then like on Fridays, I would spar in the mornings and then drive four hours to Las Vegas and then work an eight hour shift at nighttime. Wow. At the clubs, like wow. doing gymnastics all night long. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was rough. <laughs> wow. Wow. How did you get involved into, into, into stripping? Um, my parents did it while I was growing up. That's actually how they met each other. Your parents? Yeah. So your um, mom and dad? Mom and dad. Yeah. My mom was a dancer and my dad was a DJ and that's how they met each other. So <laughs> <laughs> it gets better, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it, it, it was, I guess you could say I just followed the family footsteps. It was the family business. Yeah. And when I started dancing, my dad actually taught me how to dance and how to like hustle, how to make money. He didn't teach me my dance moves, but he taught me how to make money and be a professional in the industry. And then um, I ended up writing a book so that I can help other entertainers because I had my dad to help me uh. and it's called Stripper Bible. Stripper so, Bible. Yeah. I wrote and the that was Bible before the UFC. Yes. Pre UFC. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Quite the entrepreneur and, and wow, that's 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 really something. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh and then so you got into the how did what was the how did you what was the the, the journey into MMA once you started to fight professionally? How did that happen? The journey to the UFC, because I was already in the MMA. I was an MMA fighter um almost right off the rip back in two thousand eleven. You, so you started fighting amateur. Correct. Yeah. So I was okay. fighting. Um <clears throat> But I will say, like, I never... You started in, in Cleveland? Correct. Yeah, Cleveland, oh, okay. Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Like, I never didn't have the vision of becoming something great. 
Like I knew that I was going to be destined for greatness as long as I never gave up on myself. And as long as I never quit, like I knew I was going to make it like there was no plan B for me. There was no backing out. There was no other options. Like I always did a lot of things, but this is the only thing I really actually cared about in my soul. So I made this happen. Like I, I was, I went through the trenches. Like I had the hardest, toughest fights coming up through the LFA. I mean, I could have quit a million different times. I was already making more money, not being a fighter. Like it was stupid of me to fight, but I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And now I get to be a UFC fighter. I get to be a fight analyst. I get to be a commentator. You know, I get to have the honor of being a black belt in jujitsu because I worked my ass off to be exactly right here. Wow. Getting goosebumps. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It's true. Super inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what made what what made you start to fall in love with uh, martial arts and, and the training and everything? I think um, where you knew like, hey, this is what I want to do. Yeah, I I'm a very passionate person and it's really hard for me to not fall in love with things, you know, um, artistic wise. Like I just let my soul sing with mm. whatever it is that I'm doing. And that's why I was so successful as an entertainer, as a dancer. Um, but it's also what like made me fall in love with fighting. Growing up, I was always very aggressive. I got into a lot of fights in school. Um, I fought a lot of guys. I never really? fought girls in school. Yeah. And I got kicked out of four schools in one calendar year, just mainly for fighting and just being too much. And so when fighting found me, it was like, I, it was the first time I really felt at home. You know, it was hmm. the first time I felt like I belonged here. Like I'm meant to do exactly this. And I remember the first day of training where I wanted to quit because it was so hard. I almost passed out four times. I don't think my trainer really wanted to train me. The Muay Thai, the Muay Thai class? <laughs> the Muay Thai class. I don't think he wanted to train me, you know? So he did a private with me and just basically tried to kill me. Um, and I, I just remember sitting on a bag and thinking like, man, this is so hard. Like, I, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? I'm either never going to do this again or I'm going to see how far I can go. And at the time, girls didn't do this. It's not like I like had some sort of like knight in shining armor I was looking up to. It was a me thing. You know, I was like, is this going to be one more thing that you tell yourself? Like, man, you could have been great, but you chose not to. You know, like, oh, I could have if I really wanted to, but I don't want to. No, fuck that. I was like, I'm doing this. I'm going to make this happen. So like day one, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And I know like that sounds like silly, but it's so true. Like I committed right off the rip because it was so hard. I was like, I don't want to do this. Who are some of the people that inspired you? Like, I want to be like this person or, or you know, men, women. Jose Aldo, I think was really amazing. Mm. You know, that's the first person I remember seeing on the cover of a magazine and being like, wow, like. That's awesome. You know, at the time he was the best fighter in the world mm -hmm. and he is still so legendary. Yeah. For sure. And you just like hear those names, you know, I heard Chris Cyborg's name bounced around a lot um, from the female perspective. Ronda Rousey wasn't on the scene at that time. When you first started. Right. But it wasn't something that I like, I didn't really look up to people. I got to be honest. Because they didn't even have uh, the women's divisions, right? They had, uh, what was it, the hook and shoot? Like they had women's fights, something like that. And they had the Invicta, not even Invicta, right, at that time. Yeah. No, Invicta wasn't even a thing at that right, time. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, there, was, there wasn't. So you were like, just like, I, I love to. how I feel when I do this. Yeah. And I want to be the best at it. That's, yeah. what, that's what was in your head? Yeah. I wanted to be the best I could be for mm -hmm. myself. For yourself. Yeah. Wherever the journey took you. Yeah. Every day I just wanted to be a little bit better than I was the day before. That's it. That's all that mattered to me. I, I didn't have people to look to, you know, it was like, how good can I be? And most of the time I did privates too, because I was like so much energy. I wasn't really allowed to do class with people. So it's like, I didn't have people to look at, to see like, Oh, like I want to beat that person. There was nothing to compete against except for myself. What about in the grappling scene? Are there some people that you like, wow, these this, this person is really good or this, you know, guy or girl. It wasn't until I was, um, deeper into blue belt mm. that, uh, my coach mentioned Bia Mesquite mm -hmm. one time. And it was kind of funny because then I became a purple belt and I competed against Bia. Oh, no way. Yeah. As, at a purple belt level, I competed against her as you know, she was a world renowned black belt mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, um, it's kind of crazy and very surreal. What, what event was that? This was, oh my goodness. It was 
some grappling event out of Florida. And it was like when submission only was first on the scene okay. and it was like the first opportunity that we all st uh, started getting paid. Yeah. I was on the first female EBI, which was sick. Um, I was like a part of like the scene where people started, like when the Gordon Ryan was out there, like putting up his 10 K gotcha, and yeah. like the early, early days, okay. like I was doing that, those competitions. Yeah. Starting from blue belt and purple belt competing against black belts. Just remember in Columbus, Ohio, that's where they had the Arnold Schwarzenegger events. That's correct. Yes. I went out there in 2003. They had the who's who because they had they didn't have that many events where you would get paid. Uh huh. Yeah. So they had the who's who compete in that event at that time. Yeah. Wow. That was that was in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, Sean Sol Classic Sol is what it's called. Arnold Classic. Yes. 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 Sol Barra was out there, and mm -hmm. he had some students. And they, yeah, that was wow. That was Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the middle, not the middle of nowhere, but, you know, kind of in the center of the country. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not next Columbus to like isn't really known for too many things, you know. <laughs> LeBron James. Hey, hey we, we, we created LeBron. So I always say the best things come from Cleveland. They just don't stay there. They just don't stay there. <laughs> so you, you like to go home. You like to go home and visit for, for holidays? Yes. Yes. And that's where my family is, yeah. you know. You gotta go home. You gotta stay close to the roots, and remember where you came from. How do your parents feel about you fighting? Oh my gosh, the wars that I went through coming up through the Man. rankings. You know, the what are you doing, Vanessa? Like, are you gonna ever get paid for this? Like, I was destroying my face. I've had over forty stitches on my face because of fighting. Like one of the fights, I had like twenty stitches all over. Like it was crazy. Like so many broken bones, so many black eyes. Um, and it, it, you know, they just looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, what are you doing? You know? And now they're just so proud of me and, uh, they're my biggest fans and it's, it's really amazing. My sister comes out to all my fights. It's really cool now. Like you, you're getting stitches, you're getting hurt. Why didn't you, why, why wasn't, how did, what kept you going? What made you not like, man, maybe this, maybe I should do something else or why am I doing this? Yeah, I, I literally loved it that much. I literally love fighting that much. Like there was no price that I was unwilling to pay for it. No price. You can't put a price on it. I would do it for free if nobody was watching. And now I get to do it and get paid for it and make a living off of it in front of millions of people. What a story. What a story. You were there before the beginning, before there was like really you know, money to be made in jiu-jitsu or like fighting, right? Yeah. And because uh, that's like, you started what, what year? In like 2011. 2011, It's yeah. when I started MMA. I started training Muay Thai prior to that. Tough came out in uh, 2000, like is it seven? No, five, maybe 2005. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Before that, it was like very like underground, right? Before it came, it was like, remember Spike TV? Yeah. Spike TV, the men's men's network. Yeah, I remember that. Fighting used to be on Spike. Right. And right. then it was on Fox. Right. So yeah. but that would, before that it was like underground. Like yeah. nobody really knew about it. Yeah. I'm from from I'm originally from New Mexico. Okay. Yeah. And so Greg Jackson and you know that, that was like one of his like the first like because I fought in King of the Cage and stuff. And you so, did. Yeah, yeah. I was like one of the first first like MMA champions. Before like Diego Sanchez won the first Ultimate Fighter, yeah, and then it blew up, right? Then UFC kind of blew up after that first tough. My goodness, isn't it amazing to see how the sport has truly evolved? Yeah, I I, don't, I can't say I really believe that it was going to really become a mainstream sport. Greg Jackson always did, you know. But it's just really nice to see athletes, people that you know that that love it, like you know, be be able to make a living and you know get the recognition that that you deserve. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> like we literally get to do what we love to do all day. Like for you, you would probably do this no matter what. For free, for sure. For free, for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But you get to make, you, you get to create a lifestyle from doing what you literally love doing. And they always say that growing up, you know, like you can be whatever you want to be. Like if you do what's in your heart, then you'll never have to work. And it's like, there, there is a lot of truth in that, but also like it is work. 
it is very hard. Yeah. It's difficult. You know, there is a lot of overcoming um, throughout the journey. Like there's a lot of situations that try to throw you off course. And that's your mental decision to say, I will not allow anything to get in the way of what I believe in, mm. which is myself in this moment and continuing to trudge forward. Like I know what I'm capable of. And I feel like, like I have such a close relationship with God and it's like, I'm doing such a disservice by not living to my fullest of potential because I can create so many amazing things with all of the gifts that I have. But it's like, what am I going to do? Just sit on the couch and play video games all day. Like that's not, that's not for me. Um, I, I have to get out there and I have to show off a little bit, you know, and show his glory through what I get to do. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I love it. How is it walking out in the UFC after all, all, after all these years of training and competing and fighting? It's home. It's home. It's home. It's like, I, I remember just like fighting for the LFA and just like being like a dog on the chain, like, Oh, let me loose. Let me go. Like I'm here. Like, let me show you guys I'm worth it. I'm worthy. And now that I, I'm in the UFC, I'm just like, yes, like I belong right here. Like, this is what I meant to do. Like I'm finally arrived. Like I don't feel nerves. I don't feel the tension. I'm, I feel like I'm like a wild horse in a field. Like this is what I, I get to do. Like, I'm so happy to be able to walk out and I'm so aggressive. And it's like, there's just so much like energy and passion and everything that I get to do when I'm walking out there, it's a lot. It's a lot, and I love it. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. I see those Joe Rogan uh, interviews at, after the after the, fight. <laughs> <laughs> the slap, slap fist bump. <laughs> then she jump jump on him too, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It's like my favorite part of the fight, you know, getting to do my interviews at the end. <laughs> like, what's up, man? Did you see what just happened out there? That was cool. <laughs> Can I do it again? <laughs> Yeah, I just fought on Saturday, right? And then what? Two like it's crazy. Wednesday. It's like you show me some of the bruises on your in your body. <laughs> <laughs> I think my foot's broken. <laughs> I, yeah. So I think I broke my foot, but I can't help but train, you know, like because I just really want to be on the mats. Like I, you, I don't. Yeah, train, train with us on the Thanksgiving uh, on Thanksgiving roll. That was awesome. That was, Man. That was what an honor to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, like, it was really nice to meet you. I was like, wow. It's amazing. Like you have so many people on the mats, you know, like you, you have so many black belts and so many people who just love what they do so much that on Thanksgiving, when everyone should be home with their families or just trying to scramble up the last turkey that they forgot to get, like they're here training with you. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What an honor, you know, really. <laughs> That's awesome. Have, yeah. Yeah. So uh, what's, what's next for you? What's, what's going on? Right now, um, I will be doing pre and post show for UFC 282 on UFC Fight Pass as an analyst. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And it's like since retiring from being an entertainer, now I get to do things like commentating and fight analysis and I get to study fighting and talk about the thing that I love so much in front of the world. And then I also get to fight and it's like, it's just freaking awesome. You know, like when did you stop stripping and, and just fighting full time? What, where are we at right now? Uh, November at the end of November, a yes, year ago, a year ago, a year ago, I changed my whole life in one year. My whole life changed in one year's time because I walked away from something that was holding me back. Wow. Yeah. And I was amazing at it and it wasn't worth it for me. What was it? Was this decision making like what kind of scary? Yeah, that was probably one of the scariest things I've ever done. And you're talking to somebody who steps in a cage to fight people like but walking away from something that was stable, um, something that I had already created success in something that I could do with my eyes closed. Um, you wrote a book on I how wrote to be a successful book on at it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wrote the Bible on stripping. <laughs> so. Yeah, it was hard for me to walk away from that uh, because it, it was stability for me. It was comfort, but it wasn't serving me for the journey that I knew I needed to embark on and move forward with. I had to leave that part of me behind so that I can step into who I'm meant to become. And I think so many people hold on to things that are no longer serving them mm -hmm. and they're holding themselves back. And it's like, so you, you read about it, you hear about it, you scroll past the memes on Instagram, but are you actually going to do it? And I actually did it. 
And um, I had a fight that was coming up on January, I, I don't know, January 20th, let's just say. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like the end of November, beginning of December. And I was so exhausted from training. And I remember walking, like trying to go to work and doing my makeup. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, I can't, I can't, it's not, it's not helping me anymore. Like I'm too tired. Do I really want to sacrifice you my to dreams? Focus a hundred percent. Yeah. On what you wanted. Yeah. I felt like I was sacrificing my dreams just to go to work to make money. So I wrote on my board, I said, um, shake your ass for dollars or go whoop some ass for thousands. So I quit that day. You say that again, shake your ass for dollars <laughs> or go whoop some ass for thousands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You like that? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Who else can say it like you? <laughs> hey. Yeah, I walked away. That was it. And then that that particular fight, I actually got knocked out unconscious, and um, I was cold. There and then go, right? I was doing jujitsu unconscious because she was ground and pounding me, and um, I somehow retained the guard, closed my closed my legs, overhooked, and I woke up. And I was like, Oh, how did I get here? I was like, did it take her down? Did she take me down? I was like, I don't know, but I have an arm bar and I got the arm bar. And then I won like the 50 K bonus that night for performance of the night from Dana White. And it's like that, like walking away, fighting, focusing all the hours that I've trained, like it, it paid off. It showed off, you know, and it was worth it. And that was it. Wow. Wow. So you got knocked out. You came to, you had an arm bar yes. and you make you win the 50K bonus. And then I jump in Joe Rogan's arms. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what mattered, right? That's Not the arm bar, but the, <laughs> that part arms, yes. <laughs> that went viral. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What were some of the things that people were, say, were saying on like Twitter and things like that? Oh the- my gosh, the memes were amazing. It was like Joe Rogan's wife making her MMA debut 2022. <laughs> 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 It was so awesome. Like I literally loved all of them. It was it was super cool. I was number one trending. Yeah, um, on yeah. Like Google I, I was like, oh, I, I, I know she is. I know she is. Like uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's like kind of crazy, you know, to be like the number one trending thing in the entire world for a whole week. Like freaking I'm, awesome, man. I'm trying to think of other people that have done you know different things for, with Joe Rogan after the post fight con- uh, interviews. You know, I'm yeah. trying to think of. My balls are hot. Yeah. <laughs> that went viral. That's what blew him yes. up too, right? That's a kind of popular. <laughs> but that was Joe doing it. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, but like. Oh, other people. Yeah, other people doing something that created a moment. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Wow. It was sick. It was. Wow. Sick. So quitting, quitting your. Uh, she didn't say day job, right? Your night job. <laughs> <laughs> Quitting your, your night job and uh, fully committing and then, uh, you know, bigger power, like making it happen for you. Yeah. And now we're on a three fight win streak in the UFC, which is amazing, you know, to have like some success. But the UFC, this is this is the biggest organization in the entire world. Like that makes me one of the best athletes in the entire freaking world at this moment. Oof, oh my gosh. And I break every record at the Performance Institute as well. So for the Performance Institute, you know, which is like this multi-million dollar facility that they built for us UFC fighters. Mm-hmm. And they test us, right? They test our strength, our agility, um, our explosivities, like everything, you know, like our our cognitive abilities, like when you're completely exhausted. And I literally break every single freaking record. To be able to stay focused under under stress. Correct. And it's amazing. Like, it's super cool to see the tests that they do, but then it's even better to, like, dominate them. What do you attribute that to? Um, I attribute that to my love for the sport, you know, because I truly am happy when I walk into the gym. Like I really do. I'm, I'm like, this is just like the coolest thing I ever get to do every day whenever I walk in. So it's like, I feel like just having that freedom and being like loose and like excited and trying to not look at other people and what they're doing, because maybe they're on chapter 10 and I may be on chapter seven, but I need to look at my chapter seven and just try to read a few more pages every day, you know? So I just try to be a little bit better than myself. And cause that's all I can do. Most of the time I'm the smallest person in the gym. You know, I can't compete against these freaking welterweights or whatever, 
but I can compete against me. And I do that every day. So it's like you have 13 years of just trying to be better than yourself yesterday. And that adds up, you know, it adds up and being happy. Yeah. Yeah. What do you appreciate about the, you know, the martial arts community or the, the, your training partners, you know, we called it like you're, they're your family, right? Family. Yeah. Yeah. Family. Um, I, I think it's just really amazing how everybody has their own story. You know, we're a cast of characters and everybody who walks into the mats is there for a certain reason. Mm. I mean, this is a very violent, dangerous thing to do. And it's scary. It's super scary to walk into a gym with people who are literally beating each other up all day long and you don't know what you're doing, but you're like, man, I'm going to try that. Like what? All right. You got some screws loose. I want to know. I know. I want to know what you're up to. You know, like you have something that you're battling or something that you want to create, you know, and every single person has their story and it's freaking awesome because we all get to come together on the mats. You know, we all bleed together. We sweat together. Mm. We laugh together. And we help each other through our journeys. And that's just so beautiful. Like there's nothing else like it. There's no other place where you can have like cops and criminals in the same like area helping each other. It's awesome. Bringing out the best in each other, right? Yeah. No matter who you are, what you do. Yes. It's primitive. It's primal. It's, it's what we were born for. And we get to tap into that, yeah. you know? We get to solve this puzzle that is fighting, this puzzle that is the art of martial arts. Because it is, it's a moving puzzle. Yeah. And it, it's never ending. It's always evolving. It's always growing. And when you think that you have the answers, somebody is going to come through and show you something new. Yeah. Do you see yourself training martial arts for the rest of your life? Oh, heck yeah. Absolutely. As long as I can, uh, you know, wiggle my way out of the mat. Jiu-jitsu black belt, UFC fighter. I mean... You know, the author, uh, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> motivational speaker, motivational speaker. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Yes. You're motivating me. Just hey, so that, uh, let's go. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Boom. Let's go, man. For sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful life, you know, and it's a beautiful journey. And I, I never want to let this go ever. I will train jujitsu forever. I know that no matter what I'm doing, I may not always be a fighter, an active fighter, mm -hmm. Um, I can commentate for years to come, but even once that, you know, kind of door closes, like I'll always have this to look back on and I'll always have this to go to, and this will always be an outlet for me mm -hmm. no matter what. And that's so awesome. Yeah. You know, there, there's some, some, you know, some advertisement, there was a Re Reebok that was advertising, like, what do you fight for? Have you seen that, that, you know, what do you fight for? Yeah. Like that, 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 that's the motto or whatever it is for, for, you know, different brands I've seen, like, what do you fight for? And, uh, it's, you know, it's like, if you ask people just that do only jujitsu, like, what do you fight for? What are you fighting for? What are you doing for? And they go deeper, right. Into, into like, you know, their life and, and like more, more spiritual. Right. Yeah. So what do you, what do you like when you, like, what do you fight for? People. I fight for people. I fight for everybody who didn't have somebody to fight for them because, um, so many times growing up, I was basically told I wasn't supposed to make it, you know, uh, wasn't supposed to be alive. Wasn't supposed, I should have been in jail. Like mm. I wasn't supposed to be smart. Um, so many times. And it's like, I get to fight now and I am fighting for every single person who doesn't think that they belong mm. to let them know that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're coming from, what your current story is. You can create greatness through that. You can overcome and become as long as you believe in yourself. And I believe in you because I freaking did it and I wasn't supposed to, but here I am. So let me show you the way because I, I came from the trenches, you know, I came from the dirt and I created something and I worked my ass off for it. And I know that you can too. There's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. But you got to work for it. You can't just have that will and sit on the couch. You got to get up and go. What kept you showing up every day? There's days when you don't want to, when you're like, oh, I don't feel like going in or I don't feel like training. What kept you going? Purpose. Purpose. Purpose and passion. Passion's only going to get you so far, but you have to have purpose and habits. You know, and your habits create um, your lifestyle. 
And I created the correct habits to keep me in the gym every day. And on the days where I didn't feel like it. So there were days even as an entertainer and dancing actually taught me a lot for martial arts, but there was days as an entertainer where I was just so fucking exhausted. I couldn't even show up. I couldn't mm -hmm. even go, but I did. And then I would end up creating money. You know, I'd, I'd make money and I'd generate some income. So it's like on the days where I didn't feel like going to the gym, I would still like, man, like I'd still mess up some people who maybe didn't know what they were doing. Even though I was having my worst day, they were having their best day. I was still better than them on their best day on my worst. So it's like when you start to grow in that and that takes showing up on the days that you don't feel like it just to kind of get those few reps in, you know, maybe you can't go live today, but you can still drill, you know, maybe you're hurt. But, you know, your arm hurts. Well, just kind of put your arm to the side. If you get swept, you get swept. You know, like if, if somebody takes side control, they take side control. Work your way out of those positions. You know, like if one limb is hurt, you still have three other limbs to work with. And that was so special with jujitsu where it's like it doesn't matter what you're going through. If you as long as you show up, you can do something. You can work those small margins. You can work your inches. Yeah. Just show up. Right. Just show show up, man. That's show what it's about. <laughs> That's the hardest part, right? Showing up. Dude, what, what keeps you, what keeps you going? What keeps me going? The people, you know, um, you know, I'm been doing it for so long now, but just uh, seeing people get better and improve. And, uh, that, that gets me up in the morning. That's what, uh, that's what motivates me. I yeah. see these guys like lose weight, get stronger, become more confident, really believe in themselves. It's everything. Yeah. It makes me high on life. Amazing. Yeah. So before you were a black belt, what kept you going before I was a black belt? What kept me going? Um, so it's been, it's been a minute, right? Um, I think, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's not deep, right? Deep. Yeah. And I think, uh, probably like, um, you know, I wanted to prove, you know, that I'm, I'm good enough. Right. And, uh, having, uh, having some great like family members, like I want to make them proud. Mm. So I think when, when push comes to shove and you know, maybe you're not getting the results that you want, you like, like, I'm going to try again, I'm going to try again. But you have that deep desire to really prove that you're, you know, you're worthy, you're the best. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, I think just proving that. And once you do, once you do prove that, you know, once you, you, you know, it's a, you teach others, right? Yes. Yes. Did you make your family proud? I think so. The person I think so. That, I think so. I think so. They told me, uh, hey, you know, it's, uh, it's cute. You know, they're a bunch of. My mom's side, they're a bunch of educators. Okay. So they're like, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, uh, cute or whatever. Like the girls like it, right? They went there, you're doing martial arts, but it's not like a way you can make a living. And back in those days, like nobody knew really what jujitsu was. Yeah. Back because I started, I started my first school in 2000. Uh huh. So in 2000 in New Mexico, and people knew what you know, uh, you know, karate and taekwondo were, but they didn't know what Brazilian jujitsu was yep. unless you watched those early UFCs. So I was just educating people on, on what it was. And, uh, and then, uh, I, I, I said, okay, when people said that to me, like some you know, smart people, they wanted me to go back to school and this and that. Um, but I really believed in it. I knew how it made me feel, you know, and, uh, and you saw the shame, the change in other people that yeah. were around me. And then, uh, you know, just, I never, I never looked back. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's uh, the world. That's that's the change the world needs, right? And yeah. It's martial arts and the community. There's a there's a book called um, a Tribe that I always I always talk about. Sebastian Junger. Have you heard of him? No, and I love reading. And uh, he has like these three things. Like one, we need you know like to be our, ourselves, be authentic. You know, um, what's the, what's the other one? I'm going blank. Uh, <laughs> authentic. Uh, um, um, oh my god. Um, be connected, right? Mm -hmm. We live in a city with like 10 million people, right? But mm -hmm. like everybody's on their phones and they're just so disconnected. And I think martial arts and jujitsu for me, cause it, you know, but it connects you mm -hmm. like you're like, you're connected because you're training, you're totally present. Right. Yes. And oh, you need to be good at something. Yes. You need to show that you're good at something. And if you stick with it long enough, if you keep showing up, <laughs> right. Yeah. You're going to get good. Yes. There's going to maybe be some better people. I mean, somebody's always better than you. Right. Yes. But you're going to be good. Yeah. Thankfully, somebody's always better than you. Could you imagine yeah. how boring it would yeah, be of course. if you were just like the best at everything <laughs> all the time? Of course. Of course. 
I think uh, when, I remember when I first first started training, and um, I you you don't even know that you're good, you know, like because you're just getting mauled every day, right? <laughs> when you're fresh, and you see the new person walk into the gym, mm-hmm. and you see them being really shy, like they don't know like who to talk to or what to do, and when. Like for me, I got to go up to that person, you know, and shake their hand, introduce myself, welcome them in. And then when I started showing them a few things, Mm -hmm. and I mean, we're talking back like one, two stripe white belt, you know, but when I get to show them something that what is what like solidified to me, like, oh, I do know something I can help. I do know more than they know. I may not know a lot, but I know more than them and I can give back a little bit. And that was like the first time where I was like like kind of super confident in what I was doing, you know, like I think new people need to hear that. Like it doesn't like you don't know everything and you're not supposed to, but I bet you know more than the other guy who's about to walk in the door that you haven't even met yet. Mm -hmm. So just keep, keep trying, keep showing Mm -hmm. up. You will learn. Yeah. It is hard, but you will learn. Yeah. And that book, it just talks, you know, for you to be happy, be content, right? You you need those three things. And so I think martial arts, it made me understand on a deeper level, like kind of what I do, like connecting people, right? The the being being real. You have there's no way to be fake when you're training. Nope, no, right? there's not. Yeah, that, that's all real. Your right Your personality there. is gonna come out. Yep. Your authentic self is gonna come out. Yep. Whether wh- however it is. Yes. Yes. When there's you're no red- hiding on yeah. the mat. When you're redlining that that cardio, like <laughs> if you that that's gonna come out. You know, are you a jerk? Or are you actually happy and and content with what you're doing? You know, are you actually like super friendly or yeah, that comes out. It comes out. The the truth comes out when you're fighting. Yeah, yeah. When so you're I, struggling. When yeah, you're struggling. Yeah. And you struggle every day on the mats. Every day. Even when you're good at it, you're still struggling. I hope you're being pushed. I mean, that's what, but that's what bonds us, right, is the struggle. Mm. Right? Truth. Yeah. Truth. Yeah. The struggle and the passion and the enjoyment. Yeah. <laughs> And you go home like, what the heck just happened? And then you show up again. <laughs> but it's the struggle, right? The struggle. Like we, we're all like, and it talks about in that, that book too. I, mean, I keep talking about it, but it's just so, it made such a big difference for me. Um, just the, the, just the, the human connection. And like it was, it, was, it started with him about um, soldiers coming back from Vietnam mm. and suffering from PTSD, mm-hmm. you know, and why they want to, why soldiers want to go back to war and those, 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 those scenario, those situations, right? Yeah. That they're like together in one room, like in bunks, you know? Yeah. And they're connected and they come back and they're by themselves. Yes. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, jujitsu and martial arts can yeah. be Muay Thai as well, you know, but jujitsu, you have that touch, right? Right. And I think that that's It's very special. close. It's very intimate. Yeah. It's a very intimate art. <laughs> it's, it's true. Like we are like right on top of each other, sweating on top of each other, struggling. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and we share that. We share that journey with each other because you can't grow without somebody else pushing you in jujitsu. Yeah. You know, like during quarantine, I was trying to do jujitsu stuff just to like try to stay sharp on a dummy or something in my house because <laughs> I was here in L.A. and I couldn't get into the mats. And that is how long did you do that for? Oh, my God. I, I said, fuck it. I'm going to do Muay Thai. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. You know, you Man, can only that- do so many arm bars on a dummy before you're like, OK, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I remember doing that, like maybe like five minutes for me. You know, yeah. I was like, man, I can't. This is not jujitsu. No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I was I like, sorry, it, sorry, because they wanted you to do the dummies and the social distancing and all that. Uh-huh. I was like, man, this isn't. I'd, I'd rather just not do it. Right, right. I grabbed my belt. I started doing spider guard on my belt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna do more time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll just shadow box all day. I, I can do that. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. How did you get your uh, your nickname? Little Monster. Uh, when I first started training back in Columbus, Ohio, pre MMA, when I was just doing Muay Thai, um, we had a bunch of like pro athletes in the gym as well. And like I said, I just like I just try to beat myself every single day. And they're like, man, like she doesn't stop, she doesn't quit. They're like she's a monster. And my uh, coach used to scream like, in this room, we build machines and we create monsters. So everybody just started calling me Little Monster. Little Monster. Yeah. I, I, I would outwork anybody who walked in. I would outwork them. I didn't care. I don't care how big you are. I'm still doing more push-ups than you. I'll go until you quit. 
So. Where does your uh, work ethic come from? I, I don't know, man. I'm just really aggressive. I, I have a lot of energy, so I got to get it out. And uh, I like I compete with me. Your mom was a was a was a dancer, and your dad was a DJ. Yes. What what uh, are there some other family members that you know? Because I feel like it's you just you just bred that way. Yeah. You have like a lot of energy, and you're a hard worker, and you know you have a strong mind, and you're passionate. Yeah, I I can't tell you to be honest because there's nobody who like I really like look at like that um, in my family, and I think it was a lot of like maybe because I was always overlooked, you know, and I was always just really angry and I always like had that aggression. So I finally found an outlet for it. Like even when I was in school, I was terrible at school, but man, gym class, I got an A every time, you know. Why were you overlooked? Um, I don't know because I, I think because I was so angry and like so crazy, I got in so much trouble. You know, I used to get arrested a lot and, um, I, I just, I, I didn't care about a lot of things. I was just really angry. So I think people like really didn't take me very serious growing up. My family didn't take me serious. I was just like the black sheep, you know, getting like supposed to be nothing. And, um, what were you angry about? Maybe not being raised by my parents, being raised by my grandparents. Uh, I didn't speak English when I first came here. I came from Greece. So I was born in America. I was raised in Greece by my grandparents. And then I came back to America and I couldn't speak English. How old are you when you uh I think I was back? like seven, seven or eight. When you came back to America? Correct. So I had like gone to school in so Greece. So your formative years, you were in Greece. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then I like got held back a few times, you know, cause if you don't speak the language. language, yeah. And then I did start to learn English, but it's like, I was raised by my grandparents. So like, and they cooked a lot of Greek food, you know, What's and it, what, what place in Greece? Not fucked us. So it's like towards the bottom of the peninsula, okay. like people take a ferry over to the islands from our city. Yeah. And Katohora, which is up in the mountains. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful up there. Yeah. Wow, wow. So I was always like the funny kid in class, you know, like I was kind of like a dork, like I didn't fit in anywhere. And it wasn't until I was uh, even like in high school, I started playing football. So it's like I wasn't your standard girl. <laughs> like I just. Yeah. Why did, why did you live in Greece? When uh, why did you grow up in Greece? Why? Because my parents were just wild and crazy, like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So I was raised by my grandparents and they wanted to go back to Greece. That's where they were born and raised. Their grandparents. My grandparents. And uh, so they took us back to Greece with them. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have one younger sister and a brother who's uh, several years younger than us. Yeah. My sister's like really close in age. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I can relate to going. I lived in Germany when I, when I was a kid. Okay. And uh, we did moved. you like have the language barrier? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, uh, for, I, st I stopped to speak uh, English. Uh, we came back when I was. I, I was there from four to like seven, and then I came back for a year because I wasn't speaking English at all. Uh huh. I was going to German schools, and so then we came back for a year, and then I went back to Germany. But uh, I remember being kind of like a little bit of like a phobe, you know, fresh off the boat kind of. Like, uh -huh. Yeah, it's funny. Uh -huh. It's hilarious, but it's hard to imagine, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, and it took me a little little while to kind of get assimilated and, 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 and speak really well and yeah. read and write well. All right, it's probably a little bit slower, right, to, to read and write. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it took a while. It took a while. And like, I, I couldn't communicate with people. So I would just like, I don't know, throw a fit or frustrated. steal stuff or yeah. Okay. Like, I, I need your pencil. I don't know how to ask you for it. So I'm going to take it. In yeah. Cleveland too, huh? It's probably uh, a little bit different. Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> it's a little rough. A little rough. Grease. Opa. Opa. <laughs> <laughs> The Greek, my big fat Greek wedding. Super accurate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I literally have an aunt named Tula. Like, and that really? was the star of the show, like in her, uh, in the show. Yeah. Like, it's super accurate. Oh, you don't eat meat. That's okay. I give you lamb. <laughs> like, yes. Do you have a big, that big family? Super huge family. Yeah. Super. A lot of cousins, a lot of aunts. Everybody's your aunt. Even if they're not like actually related, they're still your aunt. Yes. Huge family. So, so your mom and dad, they, they lived in Cleveland, but everybody else was in Greece. 
No, everybody was in Cleveland. So like even my grandparents had who there. had a lot of like brothers and sisters, okay. all of their brothers and sisters moved to Cleveland. Okay. Yeah, from Greece. Okay. Yeah. So it's like we had a huge family and everybody was in Cleveland. Yes. Wow. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. And so why, why were you a black sheep? Uh, I, I don't know, because I, I got picked on a lot in school, you know, and I was just, like I said, I, I just, like, didn't really have, like, the best attitude, so I got into a lot of trouble, and I think I just started getting, like, written off after a while. You know, like, you get arrested so many times before they're like, oh, well, all right, it's just Vanessa, you know, like, it was really bad. <laughs> like, I, you know, you, somebody meets you, you're happy, you're smiling, you have such a great attitude. Thank what you. Like, what shifted? I think I got to a point where I was like, is this all I'm ever going to be? You know, like already nobody believes in me. Like mm. there was no expectation for me to be anything than what I already was. So I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. And um, it's like if, if I just continued on that path, like it wasn't pretty. So I made the decision to start shifting. I think dancing actually kind of scared me straight, scared me sober, if you will. You know, like you see the girls in the clubs that are still like doing this after so many years and they can't escape. And I'm like, wow, like, is that what happens if you just keep partying every day for so many years? So I, I started to like shift myself and started reading books and um, reading books, reading books changed my life. Yeah, I read like, I think over 100 books in a matter of like a year and a half's time. And um, started just like reprogramming my mindset because I didn't have anybody to lean on to do that, you know. And uh, I started finding people that did believe in me, um, started really holding on tight. When I found fighting, I really held on tight and went along for the ride. And there are good people amongst the gyms that started to see my potential and give me advice. Mm. And when someone would speak to me, I would take it. You know, I never wrote people off. I, I took the information no and I lived are. it. Yeah. And I just held on to positivity and I started changing my mindset. I started changing my language, how I spoke, how I spoke to myself more, most importantly. Yeah. I really, I really reprogrammed my mind, started telling myself how much I love myself, how much, you know, it's okay, Vanessa, like you're having a rough day today. Like tomorrow's going to be better. You, you can recreate your life. Did that by surrounding yourself with the books and the right mentors yes. to be have those that, that self-talk in your head. Yes, yes. And that wasn't until I was already an adult. You know, I, I could have <laughs> I could have just chose the other path. It was easier, but and this was the harder way around, and I did it. You know, I worked in a restaurant right after high school. Like, I've been blessed because I've pretty much just done martial arts like almost my whole life. But I worked in this restaurant, a fine dining restaurant. And it was interesting because people are still, they were still, you know, years ago, they were still there and they never really uh, move up or, you know, they, they're still doing the same thing. Like they would make a lot, we would make a lot of money yeah, and then they would blow it that night. They would go out and like, you know, do drugs or drink or whatever, mm -hmm. spend all their money every single night. And then they would be in the same spot, you know, the next year or, you know, yeah. every, every year. Yeah. And not, didn't, didn't change a thing because it's easy. You is know? that is that the same thing in in dancing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, easy come, easy go. You know, the quicker you make the money, the faster you can spend it because you'll go back tomorrow and make the same money, and you know that. But you can only do that for so long. Mm, it's a shelf life. Yeah, <laughs> you can only do that for so long. You're only gonna have that hustle, that hunger for so long. Yeah, and mm. I, I recognized that when I was younger, and my dad kind of taught me a little bit of that too. Yeah. What did he tell you? Um, he he really helped me amongst the industry. He's like, you know, the, the faster you make the money, the faster you'll spend it. Um, you can only do this for so long. He's like, think about some things that you would never do for money. Never do those things. He's like, this is a really tough industry, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, one day you're going to walk away from this and you want to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and know that you were the person you wanted to be, not the person that the money made you to be. And mm. that was like major for wow. me. That was life giving. Yeah. So I got to walk away with my morals and my values. And that's actually why I wrote the book was to help girls amongst the, like this crazy freaking ride of a roller coaster to try to keep who they are intact on the way out the door, the same way that you walked in. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My dad really taught me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. What a, what a, what a, <laughs> it's like a left and right field, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then finding your martial, finding the martial arts mm -hmm. in that process and, uh, yeah. And going all in, right? All in, all in. Yeah. Burn the boats. There's no way out. We're doing this. What were some of the books that you started to read that really, uh, started to change you? Oh, there's so many. It's so many. Um, Phil Collins, no, not Phil Collins, mm -hmm. uh, from good to great, good to great, yeah. good to great really helped me a lot. Um, thinking big was like a good starter book. Um, man, I, it's so hard to think of them off the top of my head. Yeah. When I was 18, I wasn't sure what I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. Atomic habits was Atomic a good habits. one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I kind of, I did, uh, I would, I didn't have like all the, I had some mentors already, but, mm -hmm. uh, that took some interest in me, like really su successful business people in the area. That was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, but I was working at the restaurant and so I started reading books, you know, to kind of like, those are my friends, you know? Yeah. And so I just read it, read the books every, like by myself, you know, uh, and then would train. Then I set my goals. I, got, I read, uh, think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill. That was a good one. Yeah. He talks about burning the, burning the, uh, that's, that's why burning the that. boats. Yeah. Right, that's <laughs> that's, from, rich, that's yeah. from think and grow rich. <laughs> Committing, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Not giving yourself a, an option B, right. you know, knowing that you're going to create this, you're going to make this happen. You know, they like, people like to say, Oh, well, you have to have something to fall back on. I'm like, Nope. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> why? So you can have an excuse to quit. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, I, and I mean, that book her is all about- TED Talk. Yeah, that's all about vulnerability, mm -hmm. but it's also like, she she wrote a lot of books and I read them all. Um, it's really about like becoming who you are in your heart and taking the chance on yourself. Mm. You know, uh, th her main thing was Theodore Roosevelt who talks about the man in the arena. Mm -hmm. Like it's easy to judge from the outside perspective, but only the man who's actually in the arena bleeding is the one who truly knows. And you're not always going to make it just because you try, but you have to try if you're ever going to make it. It's the act of trying, right? Yeah. That's where it's at. Yeah. You yeah. have to, you have to, I'm never going to be an NBA player. Uh, I mean, I can try it, but I'm never going to be an NBA player. So you got to give yourself the correct chance in life too. you know, look at the skills that you already have. Look at the things that you're already great at, the things that you're actually passionate about and actually love. And then you can create something spectacular from that. Um, it, it's awesome. There, there's like a chart and I think it's like Ige or something, but it's like what you love, what you're good at and, um, what you have passion for or something. And it's like finding that, finding like what is for you in your life. And some people have multiple things, you know, like I, for me, I think one of like a trying thing for me is I, I do have a lot of passion for everything that I do. And it was choosing, you know, and making choosing. a decision mm -hmm. and sticking to that. Cause I can create greatness in other fields as well, but that's only going to take attention away from what I'm currently doing. So, you know, 50 cent, Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 You know, so, uh, you know, it's a, so a few people told me about his books. I was like, you know, what? I'll just get it, you know, and uh, just, you know, his, his way, his style of communicating, but he says all the right things, right. Of success. And one of the, one of the chapters I think is, is, is on passion. Mm. And he kind of talks about passion. Like people don't have the passion for the follow through. Mm -hmm. That's how he defines kind of passion. Like people don't have the passion, like they're going to do this, but that, but they don't have the passion for the follow through. Yeah. Everybody wants to start, you know, so I, cause that passion for me was like, you know, the, just the enthusiasm, right. The, just, you know, the, the passion being excited about things yeah. and then hearing him talk about passion in that way, I was like, yeah, that's it. You know, it's like most people, they want to start something, but the follow through the showing up yeah. when you don't feel like it. Right. Yes. Doing it when, you know, nobody else is doing it and believing in yourself mm -hmm. when nobody else is doing it. Mm hmm. When no one's even and watching. Does, nobody's watching. Yep. Everybody's doubting you. Yep. And you're doubting yourself, but you still step into the arena having the passion, you know? Yeah. Really, uh, I was like, ah, oh, he's really good. Yeah. So. It's different. It's different. We're built different. And I, I would love to believe that everybody has that for something. Mm -hmm. For sure. I'd love to believe that, you know, I want to think the best of everybody all the time. 
And I, I don't know, you know, like, cause I feel like we can all create greatness in something, you know, we're all passionate about something, but are you going to find it? Are you going to look for it? Are you going to search for it? And then are you going to follow through with it? Yeah. I mean, Hey, like the, we talked about the thick and grow rich Napoleon Hill. He has a formula of success. Yes, he does. He interviewed all the most successful people, you know, like a hundred years ago Uh huh. and they had a formula of their success, right? So they can, they can. They just have to keep doing it and have the follow through, when, which is one of the principles, right? Yes. There's a literal blueprint to yeah. success. There's a blueprint. <laughs> follow the yellow brick road, man. You'll get there. I promise. Like, <laughs> yeah. And like, that's like something that I believed in. Like it didn't like, man, if you saw some of my older fights, whew, you'd be surprised I ever walked in there again. I promise. It's crazy. I'll show you pictures afterwards. It's like. But I, I just, I believed and I knew, I was like, if I don't quit, I'm going to make it. I just have to not quit. How was it after one of the, like, you know, after, after a loss, like a tough loss? Um, I think I, one of my toughest, back? one of my toughest losses, I had to remember that fighting doesn't define me mm. and it's about your level of attachment. You know, was I more attached to fighting than I was to who I was as a person? Mm-hmm. And I, I knew that um, I loved myself. I knew that I was loved by my family and that fighting wasn't the only thing that defined me. So even if I lost, I was still an amazing human. I I was still a beautiful person and I still had people that I loved. Um, But man, it's rough, you know, because you dedicate your entire life to this. Even though I want to say that it doesn't define me, it low-key kind of does course yeah everybody's you're on, you're on center stage you're in, it's what everybody's you're looking at for. you they're judging you yeah and you're only as good as your last fight right yeah and in, in the mma kind of yeah arena yeah and uh it does kill you a little bit you know but i had to remind myself that it only kills a part of me it doesn't kill me i still get to survive i still get to create a new story the next day and um self-talk is major self-talk is so big Because what you say to yourself, it doesn't matter what somebody else is saying to you. You have to really believe it in your heart and in your soul. You have to know what you're saying to you, no matter what other people are saying to you, no matter what the comments on Instagram are saying, you know, and that's so hard for a lot of people. It's hard for a lot of people at the high level, you know, let alone prior to getting there. Yeah. Those negative thoughts, negative, whatever, uh, things. How do you stop it? You shut it down. You shut it down before it gets too loud. You know, uh, cause they're there, they're there, they're there. If you're doing great, they're there. If you're doing shitty, they're always going to be there, but you get to give it attention or not. You get to tell it to shut up or not. You get to change your own narrative. You get to look at yourself in the eye in the mirror mm-hmm. and allow yourself forgiveness in having those moments, forgive yourself for them, but then move past them. It's just a moment but it can become bigger if you don't nip it in the ass Mm -hmm. right away. You have to stop it before it becomes something too big. It's a choice. It really is a choice. Well, I'm a big fan. You've made me a big fan. (laughs) You're You're awesome. You're amazing. I love your mindset. (laughs) I love how you think. I love your story. Oh my God. What a story. (laughs) What a story. I'm like, I'm going to watch all of your fights from now on. Let's go. And uh, congratulations on just everything you've you've you've, you've done already. Thank what, you. What a story. Thank you so Amazing. much. I feel like I'm just beginning too. Yeah, I feel like yeah. I've just arrived. Yes. You know, 13 years later. Yeah. I just got here. Overnight sensation, right? Right, right. <laughs> 10 years to be an overnight success. Thank you so much uh, for just like having the mindset that you do to be able to help us to both open up and share with the world because that's what we're getting to do right now. Thank you so much. Heck yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you.